Hello, everyone. So we're starting to get our participants rolling in here. Welcome to Mix with the Wild. My name is Austin with the Wild, and we're so happy to have you here. Uh, we've kicked off with a poll to get this started for our topic today. So if you wouldn't mind just filling that out as we wait for more people to attend, we'll be eager to share our results for this. So based on that question, you can see today for Mix with the Wild, we're focused on bringing people into VR from initiative to adoption. A bit about Mix with the Wild. This is a monthly series that we host for innovative AEC and design teams such as yourselves to learn how to save time, design smarter, and collaborate from anywhere using virtual and augmented reality. Now, um, some of you might be attending for the first time and are curious, who is the Wild? I might have been familiar with Iris VR, Prospect, or different brands coming into this. So about the Wild, we were founded in 2017 with the mission to shorten the distance between ideas and shared experiences. Today, we own Excuse me. Today we own both products, Prospect by Iris VR and The Wild. And combined, we help over 60,000 leading architects, designers, engineers, and builders use platforms such as these to connect their teams across distance for better collaboration, presentations, and BIM coordination through a combination of virtual and augmented reality. You'll notice that both of these products span all the way from ideation to coordination, providing flexibility for from design to construction. We're not gonna be as focused on these products today per se. We don't, we don't want this to feel like a sales pitch. What we're really focused on today is the topic of our webinar is focusing on the benefits that VR has for your building company's collaboration, but overcoming the reluctance that we have for adoption for this. Uh, a lot of us have heard stigma with VR. We have questions on the acceptability and so forth, as evident by these questions that we're showing in the polls here. Um, so in this brief 20 to 30 minute conversation, uh, this will be guided by AEC Immersive Technology Consultant, AJ Lightheart. We're gonna share practical tips on what other leading building firms have used to successfully implement VR for their team collaboration. And then we'll leave about five or 10 minutes at the end for Q&A on how you can champion this technology for your firm. And we'd like to encourage you to leave any questions you have in the chat or at the Q&A button at the very bottom down here. We'll be referencing those and pinning those questions for the end. So who is AJ? AJ is an emerging technology leader in the AEC industry for the past 11 years. He's been a trusted advisor for SMB, the e &R top 500 companies, and he's consistently found a passion for connecting technology to a practical ROI. Outside of his consulting, AJ loves trying new craft beers and trying to keep up with his boys. Hello, AJ, and thank you for sharing your time with us today. Now, hey, Austin, and uh, thank you as always for your way too kind of an introduction. Uh, happy to be here. And uh, again, echoing what, what Austin said a moment ago, appreciate you all carving times out of your hectic schedules, work, life to join us today, whether it be uh, your second, third, fourth time being a part of Mix, or if it's your first time, welcome. We look forward to seeing you upcoming uh, as as well. And we want this to be a, a short hit, quick hit, where you can walk away with tangible items to support your VR journey wherever you're at within it. And we always want these to be very relevant. So in addition to the questions for the session today, if you have other topics you would like us to cover in upcoming sessions, we are all ears feel free to drop those into the chat as well. Awesome, thanks for the kickoff, AJ. Yeah. Um, so again, we're thankful for your time here, but as we talked about in the topic, there are a lot of roadblocks to getting our teams into collaborating with VR. And looking at the poll results that we have right now, it looks like 44% of us are just kind of unknown on the use cases of VR within our team's collaboration. And that can, that can be difficult to share with our other stakeholders um, and then the second highest at 24% is hardware uncertainty or cost, which there's a huge stigma against that. Um, a, a lot of us are facing these preconceptions that VR was specifically for gaming yep. or was really expensive to get set up. So what do you say to people who are having these questions? Is it just a fad? Is it too expensive to get into and justify an ROI? Yeah, no, and thank you all for, for filling out the poll question. That will really help uh, position some of the areas that we'll focus on here today uh, as, as well. And it, it is such a big, big question. You know, VR has in many ways faced an uphill battle in 
getting accepted and adopted within uh, within business applications. And my first piece of advice for anyone that's trying to really drive this as we're on the front end of the initiative side is you have to first get your head right. You, your team, your cohorts that are really trying to drive this have to recognize that this is not a fad, that there are significant business applications and, and use cases. And it's not like you have to do Jedi mind tricks on yourself to make yourself believe the false reality. If we look at the massive investments that the likes of, likes of Facebook, um, and Apple are making into this technology. They're not doing that just for, for fun giggles. They recognize that this is going to transform the way that businesses are, uh, are working, how we're collaborating. So they're doing it for a very, very tangible reason. On the same vein too, connecting it back more to the AEC industry specifically, we have started to see a trend and an uptick of some government municipalities and, and projects to, to work on with them are requiring that VR is a part of that proposal process. And, and on that same vein, even in the, 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 the public and the private sector, clients requiring or requesting that VR be a part of how, your work, how we're working together. So what that is indicating is that Eventually, this is going to become a very much a have to do as opposed to a want to do. And then putting firms in a position where it really could become a billable service offering for them uh, in many ways as, as well. And the third piece just of getting your head in the right spot, and it kind of connects back to the poll question, technology around VR is more accessible than ever. Now, gone are the days where you need to have a massive uh, you know, necessarily a massive space with lighthouses all over, a huge, powerful uh, uh, PC, tethered cords, tripping, all that that goes goes with it. Uh, the untethered headsets, the Oculus Quest 2, the Pico Interactive, you know, spoken on, on the, the Quest 2 specifically, the retail value of that headset is $299. So it's more than accessible than ever to get your team started on this path of implementing into your design process. Yeah, that's, to me, it's just insane when we discovered how affordable this new Oculus Plus headset was, literally one fourth of the cost of the average business flight. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about how easy it is to get sign off on relatively affordable investment that ages very well, that is a no brainer for us. So AJ, you shared with us, it does seem that VR is accessible to get into with the hardware as well as having real business value that we've seen both from customers of the wild and prospect, but also across different industries. But how can we help people on this call specifically, um, seeing that we have attendance, a lot of different engineering, architecture, yeah. building firms, how, how do they prove this value to executives and get sign off to show that there's a real ROI for that? Because that's a question a lot of us have. Yeah, no, I mean, it's where the rubber meets the road, right? I mean. Uh when push comes to shove, there has to be a quantifiable and tangible business return for this to not just gain traction, but to really evolve and adopt, be adopted further within the organization. And I will say, you know, I, I do feel from in talking with firms and what I see is that you can't just rely on the sizzle and spice of VR to sell it. That might get people open-minded to it, but don't just put all of your eggs in that basket that it shows well, it's exciting. Otherwise you're putting yourself in a very compromised position where this initiative won't even get started or it won't get very far once you are starting to get it within, within your team. So I think the first thing that I would advise any organization that is looking to get VR started is look at how your team, how your company has made other technology purchases in the past, right? History is a good indicator of, of the future. And there likely are some very tangible approaches, steps that were taken that you can take in how you're trying to run your evaluation of VR as, as well. So a simple thing, but a very helpful tip, I would say to get started with. Um, and the second piece of that is how specific is your company in what, what defines success, what defines ROI. Some firms just general uh, returns, like it helped our team collaborate better, or it was a, uh, a, a, a way for our clients to feel more engaged. In some cases, that's enough. But in most cases, and, and to really your question there, Austin, 
we have to start to get very specific on where it can impact the design design process. And thank you for that beautiful visual there, Austin, in that VR, if you really take some time to think about it, it's biggest asset is how nimble and flexible it can be in really finding its way into any and all avenues of your design efforts, whether it be early stage charrettes and even supporting team meetings and idea sharing to earlier to mid stage master planning and into design reviews, heavy coordination and issue tracking and clash detection, interacting with your subs to final renderings and walkthroughs with, with your customers. So take the time to really be open-minded that it can have multiple tentacles within your business. Don't hyper-focus on just one use case because if you're doing that, a few negative things can come from that. One, again, you're minimizing what the potential returns can be, but two, you're also inadvertently in some ways kind of consolidating the segment of your business, the team members that may be using this. And if we wanna drive adoption of this within your firm, we need to have it appropriate and applicable to as many different segments of your team as possible. Mm. Yeah, so, so you're, you're touching on all the different workflows that VR is able to span across. Can you give some examples of companies who've done a really good job of using VR both internally for their own coordination, but also externally with other clients? Who, who's yeah. leading in this? Yeah, and you know, one other note, just kind of winding down the last the last topic, and I'll be happy to give some specific examples of that. Is everything we do has a time and a dollar value associated with it, right? So if we really are trying to quantify this, think about how many redesigns there are, how many extra design meetings we may have, and start to put a time and dollar value associated with where could VR minimize that? And that will be a great way and exercise for you to start to quantify things out specifically as well. But we do have the pleasure of seeing so many fantastic use cases uh, across our client base, both on the prospect side and the wild side. And uh, kind of using it in that chain of early to mid to late stage design efforts, you know, on the very front end, our friends over at Leo A Daily have done just an absolutely amazing job in using the wild around charrettes and team collaboration and an idea sharing board. So they've really found value of bringing people together as they haven't been in the office, but still being able to have that feeling of connectedness and a shared experience that you can't always get from just a, another <laughs> ironic being on a Zoom call right now, a Zoom call or just a Teams meeting. So on that team collaboration and charrette area, Leo A. Daily has done absolutely fantastic efforts on that front. A little bit later in the design process, if we look at the, uh, the likes of what Anglian Water has done in the design review, the design coordination and pre-construction, they have really leveraged prospect to help them identify clashes and issues before construction has started. And it saved them along the lines of like 25,000 pounds on certain projects. That starts to add up quite uh, uh, noticeably throughout the course of a year. So definitely justifying itself and the returns that it's creating and implementing it and using it in that area. And on that same vein, uh, the group over at BSA Life, Life Structures have found that using this with their subs um, has been a great way to minimize RFIs uh, and, and cut those out, in many cases saving $10,000 per project. So there's very good uh, use cases all throughout the design process, even to the very end, um, our friends over at uh, M2 Studios, Michael Potts, using this for visualization and rendering quality and even for fundraising efforts as well. So again, the key theme here is don't pigeonhole yourself to one area. You may have a priority list, of course, of where you've seen it fit in, but be open-minded to the fact that it really can fit in in any and all areas of your design efforts. Gotcha. So it's pretty evident that there are some really innovative companies leading on this. And as we've just touched on, it is accessible to get into VR. Um, by the way, Sloan, we see your question there. We'll address that towards the end in terms of other options that we recommend for hardware. Yeah, um, but it, it, in general, it's exciting to see that every single year it's becoming more and more affordable. But AJ, once we've figured out what our optimal hardware solution is, once we've gotten some executive sign off, 
Yeah. How do we get people into VR comfortably? When we've gotten past initiative into adoption, how do we get people past the stigma of VR for gaming and also just like the comfort of actually wearing a headset? What yep. do you recommend for first timers here? Yeah, hurdle one to hurdle two, right? You've got it going. Now, how do we actually get people people to use it? Uh, so there, there certainly are uh, a few things that we advise to our, our new customers when they're getting getting going. And in many ways, it's it, it goes along the lines of the crawl, walk, run, run approach. So you've put in the efforts, you've gotten support, uh, you, you've gotten all the ducks in a row. And how can we harness that excitement in a way that it actually starts to get deployed consistently? And the first thing I, I, I always advise people is don't feel like you have to jump right enough off the get-go into hard and heavy work. If you're trying to just get people exposed to VR the first time, um, I actually in many ways would advise you to say, just do like a, a social happy hour or a virtual happy hour and get someone into like Beat Saber or a simple game. I, you know, again, funny, say, I'm saying that, of, of saying it's not for just, just gamers, but if we can just get people in there and like laughing, and even if it's only for a couple of minutes, for some individuals, that can be that hooking moment where they're like, oh, wow, that was much different, much more enjoyable than I thought. I understand that we have a tool that we're gonna try to use in the design efforts. So that can be a good segue of getting them open-minded to that. And the other is, I, I think many times individuals' walls are already high when they're looking at this, but then when you tell them they have to go into headset right off the bat, those walls go even, bit, even higher. So maybe start with just having them come in through a desktop experience or uh, through an augmented reality experience, like uh, an iOS device. Things that have a familiarity factor for them, how they're already living you know, outside of work, but in work as well, and once they see that they can be a part of this meeting through these channels and interacting with someone else, perhaps in headset, that will get the wheel spinning for them of saying, you know what, maybe next time I'll go into headset for a minute. And then it becomes three minutes and then it becomes five minutes. And before you know it, that's how you can take someone down that crawl, walk, run approach to get them open-minded to really embracing and using the headset experience as well. Yeah. Yeah. I can't iterate enough that we view these emergencies these immersive experiences as a spectrum yeah. across extended reality, not just virtual reality, but as AJ said, all these devices can still take you to the same environment in different ways. And as we think of what hardware will look like in the future, it's going to blur those lines even more. So now's a great time to get people into it, into any hardware. And speaking of AJ, do you think we could maybe take a look at what it is like and how easy it is just to get in desktop share yeah. screen in a format exactly what we're doing here in Zoom? Yeah, most definitely. So let me share my screen here with, with you all. And while you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and pop into VR just to show how quickly, as he mentioned, you could have someone as a marionette in your office over Zoom. AJ's going to hop into the desktop view, and I'll be connected right in here on VR. Well, hello. And it looks, I see you. Hey, AJ. Hello there, Austin. There. <laughs> so uh, we're in our prospect product right now and i am just uh again in on our desktop experience but the key thing here and to austin's point is don't just view this as vr or nothing it's x xr it's about sharing experience and having different channels to to um, be a part of that experience and again for getting new individuals open-minded to this technology i truly do believe one of the best first steps is having them come in through this desktop experience but then having another counterpart in on headset like Austin is right now, because even in this desktop experience, now we're using the Zoom audio here today, but our respective products have full audio as a part of them. So you don't need to have a Zoom call going or a Teams call going. This is an all-inclusive experience. And I can still be a very active participant in this meeting because um, I have the full tool set available here to help support a design review or a design uh, coordination meeting. So for example, looking down at this model here, I'm going to use our visibility tool. Let me use, move my pane of cameras here really fast, which the visibility tool is all about layer control. And all I'm using right now is just my, my mouse, right? I'm gonna click into the categories or if you had other linked files, you could choose that. And I'm gonna turn off 
you know, the ceilings. And I'll turn them on and off here again. You can see them kind of moving around. So still feeling like I'm very much an active participant in this session. And maybe Austin had invited me here to say, you know what, let's walk through the model. Uh, I think there might be some potential clashes and I still wanna help have you the ability to identify this. So let's actually hop down here, Austin. Yeah, let's go for it. Really quickly, and I'll get myself turned around here. So um, actually this is this is perfect. And, and now I can see where Austin, Austin is at right here as he's moving around. And let's move right over here, Austin, into this, uh, this room right here. And mm -hmm. key things for you all to note as you're, you're watching. Um, one is, you know, I can see where Austin's at and Austin can draw attention to something. Perfect. Yep. I was looking in the same place. That may or may not actually be a clash, but for the point and example's sake, the fact that I can see Austin circling, circling that, or if I wanted to actually uh, put an issue on it, I can use our issue tracking tool in Prospect to say, create issue. Go up, say, you know, and let me move my notepad here. Potential clash with duct work. I can tag that as open. It's an issue. We're going to say it's medium priority. You save it. And again, we are sharing this experience together. Austin seeing what I'm highlighting and pointing to up there. You'll have access to be able to see that clash later and, and any else, anyone else on your team would. So the key theme here is one, a good light way to introduce people to this with tools they're already familiar with, just using their mouse and their keyboard. But two, is this still a more interactive and engaging experience for them than the traditional means of how you might be trying to go about having these meetings today? So that's a great way, again, that I would advise you to start new users in a VR or excuse me, an XR experience. Awesome. And I'll talk to yeah, you. super easy. As we both showed, just one person hops in VR. It can be wireless on my Oculus Quest. AJ can hop in on desktop. Um, can, can we maybe even touch very briefly on how we were talking about augmented reality? Maybe just chatting through what that experience is like and how that lens the physical and virtual world yeah most definitely so um austin's playing a video here of, of again another way that you can experience this together uh in this case the video is being recorded just on a on a, an, an ipad overlaying the virtual on top of the physical in this case what was our our office but again the key theme here is one familiar uh, familiarity Everyone has access to a phone or a tablet and they've gotten very comfortable with it. Two is someone in headset can still be that puppet master of having the full tool set, talking through, through the native audio of the platform and still experiencing and shepherding that individual through this space so that they can really be a part of it, can really understand and, and really walk through it one-to-one -one scale. Even if you're just in your small office like I am and, and want to put the model onto your coffee table. So that's been very key for, for us as, as an organization of giving our customers as many different ways to experience and bring people together so that one is going to drive adoption and two, that however people are taking in information or whatever hardware they have available to them, they can still be very much interactive and a part of these get togethers. Mm, yeah, and in terms of use, use cases for that augmented reality, we've seen interior teams using it to overlay furniture, layouts, iterations in different rooms, uh, construction teams imposing a building on the actual construction site before it's built to see how it fits into the skyline. A multitude of ways we can place that in an environment. So it's awesome to have that versatility. Yeah, um, so, and one final just piece I'll add on that before we um, uh, move on is with now the newer iOS devices having LiDAR scanners as a part, leveraging uh, you know, uh, scanning and AR and bringing it into experiences like this is easier than ever as well, because you don't need to have a dedicated high power scanner uh, to do some quick scans and bring them into a virtual or a shared experience environment. So that also has been very key in help driving adoption amongst our user base as well. Awesome. AJ, for the sake of time, I want to pick up the pace to this next session, but my next question for you is, 
um, let's say we've gotten our team on board, we see that there's a lot of different ways we can get into these virtual environments. What about when we get back into the office? How, how can we integrate VR into our physical layout of how we're collaborating? Do you have any examples to share with us? Yeah, no, I mean, I hope we're all starting to, to get closer to a point of getting back in, into the office. And, you know, the idea of a VR cave or a dedicated VR space, it's, it's an initiative I think a lot of firms had started on before the pandemic, but then it got pushed to the side, or they're looking to really refine what that space can, can look like. And, and a few examples, and just want to thank the group over at Mortensen, uh, Nathan and Taylor for, for sending some of these images over our way, their blue box. Um, studio. And a few things I'll, I'll draw attention to as I advise in any VR cave that you are looking to put together. Um, one is, and, and you can see it in this image here, have accessibility to natural light and getting outdoors very close to the space. Um, as you're getting new people into VR, and especially if you're going to be in a session for a longer period of time, you're going to want to you know, recenter your eyes, get some fresh air quickly after that experience so you can, you know, can recenter your body really as a whole. So they've done a wonderful job of right out the space, having access to a door. You'll notice on the, uh, the chairs there, one that they all have wheels on them. And, and similar to where I'm at in my office right now, I'm in a swivel chair, but when you're in VR, and, and again, going back to the idea of new users, I always encourage people to sit down when they're first getting started. One, feeling like you can just move your feet on the ground and rest your, your, your arms. It's almost like a comfort blanket that you're okay. You're, if you're looking over the edge of a building, you're not actually gonna fall over. So it's a reminder of your mind for that, but also they can move the chair around as, as needed. Um, and finally, having a nice big projector screen as well, because you at times will want to just be sharing the experience and projecting it to a larger audience. So that's where they've done a great job here where this space, it can be either open really quickly or they can turn it into almost an auditorium type of, of feel. So they really have made this space very flexible in this front. As I know, uh, the group over McDonald Miller has as well of a very nice big space and projection screen. So those are some tips that uh, would give anyone as they're thinking about a VR cave and environment. Uh, and certainly too, I would say have a mini fridge in there, have some fresh water available. Nothing uh, you know gets you back after being in VR and headset for a while. A nice, some fresh air and some fresh water. Cool. Yeah. So a lot of inspiration, a lot of ways for getting VR integrated with your office. We love helping consult with our customers of ways to creatively use their desk space or anything else. So feel free to reach out if you have questions on that. Um, AJ, I want to make sure we have time to get to our Q and A. So yeah, I guess my last question for you is like, what is there to lose for firms who do not catch up with this technology? Is it worth waiting out to see what happens? Why should we be investing in this right now? Yeah, I mean, I think they're, the, the goal of this is to future-proof proof your business. And as I had hinted earlier at our session, as some projects, some municipalities are really starting to require this as being a part of their, their proposal process, you may be missing out on opportunities to even go after certain work or work with certain, certain clients. It's a big, big risk factor. Uh, to, or to organizations, especially in this competitive market. And uh, another one that very much comes to mind too is attracting and retaining talent. We all know that the new wave of individuals that are coming into the workforce, they have been exposed to, of course, Revit, BIM, but technologies like this as well. And when they're thinking of an organization that they want to work at and build a career at, if you don't have this as part of your offering, you might be missing out on attracting new talent and even retaining some top talent as well. So another risk factor, again, we all know the war for talent is a very real thing that you are opening yourself up to. Okay, so to summarize what we've heard here, AJ, I wanna make sure I'm understanding, we're realizing that techno immersive technology is not just a niche, but it's accessible for all of our teams, has multi-applications from early stage charrettes to design review, heavier BIM coordination, all the way to issue tracking. So what are some next steps if teams are curious to learn more about these technologies from here for their teams? Yeah, and again, thank you all for, for being a part of this session here today, but we are happy to help support these conversations wherever you're at in your VR journey, whether it be on the initiative side or the adoption side. So don't hesitate to reach out to myself or other members of our team 
to get a conversation started so we can really pinpoint how you can accomplish the goals that you have around this. But a lot of VR2 and, and XR is just experiencing it. So um, we are happy to help get you into, whether it be the prospect or the wild, so you can try it out, really start to think through these use cases. So feel free to uh, take us up on that opportunity as well. Awesome, thanks for summarizing that, AJ. Yeah. All right, let's let's uh, let's go ahead and get into some of these questions. I know we've already got about six waiting so far and Great. I see some in our chat as well. If you have any others, feel free to add it to the Q&A. And if we can't get to it now, we'll be sure to follow up with you. Um, but I'm gonna start with our first question by Sloan Springer. I'm gonna answer this live. Given Facebook subsidization, subsidization on Oculus via giving our data to them and being required to use Facebook to access the device, what is your recommendation for an alternative untethered device? I tried the Quest 2 and loved it, but personally and professionally, just can't justify the privacy issues of Facebook. AJ, I'll kick this one off, and then maybe if you have anything to add. Please. Um, Sloan, we certainly hear you. There, there's definitely a trade-off to privacy with using the Quest 2 for the consumer version. Um, Oculus is doing amazing things in pushing the boundaries of VR, but they're also kind of growing at a pace where it's hard to compete with that. Um, so there is an Oculus for Business solution available on, um, if you do a Google search or look on our website, we can have more information on this, but it's an enterprise grade headset available for, I believe 7.99 was the last price we saw for it. Um, it provides a very secure option for teams to, um, to uh, deploy across multiple device managers, has security and is enterprise grade. AJ, anything else to add to Oculus for Business? Yeah, no, I mean, you really hit on the key points there where it does um, create greater security. Uh, if you are trying to do a larger rollout and adoption, the administrative efforts and the time it saves is substantial on that, that front. So it definitely is worthwhile on both of those uh, levels. And then in terms of other untethered devices, we also recently uh, provided support for the Pico Neo 2 for the wild. Uh, this is another great enterprise grade headset at $699. Um, we have more information on this on our website as well, but this as well allows you to use the multiple device manager to deploy at scale, um, has control over applications on this, and is also pretty lightweight, pretty powerful standalone device. In addition, HP also announced their standalone device that we're excited to learn more and continue supporting our partnership with them. Um, so Sloan, those are a couple options of untethered headsets. As rapidly as the technology is growing, though, we're, we're certain to see even more options provided within the future. All right, next question. Um, it looks like Lyle's question also was very similar to the Facebook account. Um, we'll go to the next one that Lyle has is, our main issues to implementing VR, we've used it for over four years now, is getting some project managers and even clients to use it and see the benefits. What do you have to say to Lyle, AJ? How do we get these project managers and clients to see the return on investment? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, certainly it, it can be challenging up front to get people to recognize where it can be applicable. So one thing that I would advise, especially for your project managers, because then we're talking people within your, your team, is, uh, and Austin even had like a, a little visual of, of, um, of our team, team meeting, of, of sitting around. So use, find ways to use this tool in some of your recurring meetings already, whether it be your weekly design reviews or your weekly team meetings. Don't emphasize it or over the top force it down people's throats, but just drop it in for a couple of minutes. Maybe it's the last five minutes of your weekly design review, review meeting. Um, Cause then you can start to get the wheel spinning for people of, oh, wow, I didn't know we could use it for that. Or maybe it could be applicable. Uh, here. And you've heard me say it many times, I very much view anything around VR as a snowball, where it starts small and you start to get it bigger and you get it bigger. So that would be one of the best pieces of advice I would give you, Lyle, of find a way to use it for your recurring meetings slowly and build it up, build it up. Because if you can get your project managers behind it, then they'll be more apt and open-minded to doing a similar thing with recurring meetings they may be having with their clients just doing it for a couple of minutes and then that builds, it builds, it builds. So that'd be the advice I give you. Mm. And Lyle, as well as everyone else in this call, we also want to follow up with some of these case studies that Adrian yes. was referring yes. to so that you have a wealth of information in your arsenal to go to your project managers and clients for to show that there's 
real business value on this. So hopefully that will provide helpful as well. I mean, AJ and many of our other technology consultants are, to be honest, experts at getting buy-off within teams. So feel free to use us as a resource as well if you need for growing internally or with other clients as well. Thank you for that question, Lyle. Um, next question we have, Pam Gwen. I have a GTX 5000 GPU, which is the top GPU. However, Oculus Quest 2 Cable Link hasn't supported that GPU yet. Do I need to downgrade my laptop? Uh, Pam, great question there. Th that is a very new GPU. And to, to be honest, we're still new to learning support for this. I would say this is more of an Oculus Link question. They have an amazing Q&A section on Oculus website. Um, they do also support AirLink, which is a new way of having a tethered experience to your Quest. Um, as long as you have a solid five gigahertz Wi-Fi, you can wirelessly stream from your laptop to your Oculus Quest 2. So give that one a try, and if it doesn't work, um, feel free to reach out to us for more questions or using the Oculus Q&A section. Um, let's see. Oh, Pam also asked, this is a cool AR app. Are you guys thinking about putting it on HoloLens or any AR glasses? AJ, have you, what, what do you have to say to that? Uh, it's a great question. Uh, in many ways, it connects back to just, you know, headsets, uh, equipment. As we start to see requests from our customer base of heavy adoption of any headset, we look at supporting it. And yes, you know, the AR, and thank you for the compliment on the AR side. The team's worked really hard on that. Um, HoloLens, we see it in some cases, but until they become a little bit more consumer friendly um, from a price point and we see them more heavily leveraged consistently across the board. Um, and, and I'm not just you know calling out HoloLens here. Again, we drive what we support and where we put our technologies based off of supply and demand of what our customer base is doing. So we definitely are looking at, at equipment um, of, of for, for AR, of what we're seeing our customers using, and that will drive where we might be wanting to take our technologies as, as well. Um, and that's also for on the VR side, headsets. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, we're keeping our eyes on some things upcoming here of where our AR may be uh, available. Awesome. All right. Um, it looks like that's about all the questions we have right now within our Q&A. Um, we will go ahead, as we mentioned, and send you a follow-up email with all these resources that we've talked about to get buy-off on your team. But we really want to be sure that you're trusted consultants in this process. AJ, do you have any summarizing thoughts for, this, for people here? Yeah, no, again, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we have a lot of great resources on our respective sites, so uh, leverage those. Use them to your advantage of starting the conversations, building the conversations. And again, Think about all the, the aspects of your design process and how many different buckets or how many different tentacles can this technology have? That's going to put you in the greatest spot of success and really both get the initiative uh, uh, sign off, but also adoption after the fact as well. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for your time. Again, as we mentioned, feel free to follow up with us via email or chat for your recommendations for our next mix webinar. Uh, we're, we're happy to answer any questions you have, so keep an eye out for that follow-up email. And until then, thank you for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Take care.